Welcome back to another exciting episode of College Football Pros. I am one of your hosts, Nick, and I am joined today by the co-host with the ho-host, Drew. I don't know. Does that was that a good? Was that better than the Ezekiel Elliott one or? I mean, I feel like yeah, ho ho. You know, Christmas. I, like, I was trying. You call me fat. I mean, because July. Of the ho-hos. No, but I'm saying like, are you going the Christmas in July route, or are you calling me fat because the ho's? I was getting to something to rhyme with co-host with the most. Co-host, yeah. I, mean, I didn't I want to go with I guess co-host with the sense. most, so I went with ho-hos. I think we'll just put that in the uh, do not repeat Yeah, it's one column. time. We'll do anything one time, right? That has been the uh, – the, well, actually, the motto of, of my life has been I'll try anything twice. And oh, okay. I'm running at about a 3% success rate with that. Ah, nice. So – uh, my advice to anyone listening is it's probably better to not even try anything once. Yeah, agreed. So, but anyhow, hey, we're, we're here. <laughs> we're excited. We're going to talk about the SEC West today. So that should be fun. I mean, that's a conference that always has its eyes on it. And this year should be no different because uh, top to almost bottom, uh, it could go so many different ways. Yeah, the SEC West is always uh, very, very difficult to predict and difficult to go through if you're playing because just of the caliber of the teams, of the coaches, and of the fan bases too. I mean, some of the best fan bases in the nation. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. So it just makes sense that we'll jump right in, and we're going to do this alphabetically. I uh, don't <laughs> think we're playing uh, any favorites here because we are not. But we'll start with Alabama. And just looking over their numbers from last year, 29th in passing offense, 37th rushing offense, overall 18, 59th passing defense, 4th rushing defense, and overall 12 defense, scored on average 36.9 points per game and allowed the 6th fewest points in the country at 18.4. So this is one heck of a football team we're talking about here. Yeah, when you talk about Alabama, you talk about the pedigree of their past, uh, you know, trophies and conference trophies, national championships, Heisman Trophy winners. You know, the, the list goes on and on. Uh, Alabama, to me, is a team that they're going to start rank, you know, start the season ranked high, no matter what you say about them. You know, the SEC West, top to bottom, is very, very good. My question becomes. Can they go? Can a team, not just Alabama, but can any team go through the West undefeated? I mean, it's going to be tough because yeah. there's there's three to four teams here that I really think are are built for this for this specific division, and not all of them could win those games. So there's there's going to be a lot of opportunity for teams outside of of the SEC. West this year to really exploit that. I feel like last year, you know, you kind of knew what you had in Alabama. And there were some teams that throughout the year, you know, came on, but they pretty much fizzled out relatively yeah. quickly. Um, the one thing I think with Alabama is that they just have enough depth that when somebody leaves, it's, it's not that difficult to replace them. And yeah. that's really the mark of a good program. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you have to, you know, replace a guy like Blake Sims, who was a season, single season passing uh, record holder at Alabama, uh, the top three receivers all gone with Cooper, White, and Jones. Uh, and obviously, TJ Yeldon gone. So they uh, they've got some issues uh, in experience, uh, I guess you could call it. Uh, however, with Lane Kiffin on that offense, they're, they're just going to. Uh, you know, picking in place whoever they want to put in there because, like you said, I mean, the recruiting has been top notch. They're the, the the drop off between you know a guy like Christian Jones and whoever might replace him. You know, it, it's not going to be that dramatic at the end of the year. You know, obviously, right now we're sitting here going, you know, they have the pieces to be put there and they may not all be household names such as a TJ Yeldon, but at the end of the year, you're going to know the name of Derrick Henry or some, somebody else is going to take that spot and you're not going to forget about Yeldon, but you're going to go, okay, yeah, he was just as good as TJ Yeldon. Yeah. There's no question about it. Alabama's built to, to last these uh, in and outs of, of the college football program. I think the most interesting 
thing for Alabama this year starts at the quarterback because is this the year that Jake Coker is finally going to be you know, a, a starting quarterback? We saw two years ago you know, the expectation was that he was going to start at Florida State. That didn't happen. We ended up having Winston for that year. Yeah. We thought coming to Alabama that he was going to have – an opportunity over Blake Sims that never made to, to fruition. So I guess like what my biggest curiosity becomes with Jake Coker is that is he really a starting quarterback or is he just a placeholder until they find someone better? I mean, I kind of feel like the evidence is there with him being surpassed by Winston and him being yeah. surpassed by Sims that he might not have that pedigree to be what is necessary to start all the way for this Alabama team. Yeah, and you know, they they bring in or not bring in, but they brought in, you know, uh David Corn- Cornwell who at the end of the spring practices from everything that I've read and seen, you know, really started to come on late in the spring. So he's a redshirt freshman, not of a lot of experience, if any. So we'll see how that turns out with Coker. Um, I'm really interested to see what they do with the backfield though. You know, uh, you insert a guy, Derek Henry, you know, a big guy, six three, two forty two. you know, a big dude that can blow you over. Um, you have Kenyon Drake back there. Uh, I don't know if you remember his broken leg when he was at Ole Miss, you know, playing Ole Miss last year, that was kind of gruesome. Uh, so those two guys in the backfield, a ton of versatility, ton of speed. So I, I don't know if you're going to see a dramatic drop off, you know, in that position. No, I personally think that it, that Derrick Henry can it can definitely hit 1,500 yards with double digit touchdowns, and Drake as kind of the uh, change of pace back coming in with another 600 and and a handful of scores. Ultimately, what I think is, I mean, this appears to be a a team that is taking a step back in in quality. I think Coker could have a good year if he ends up starting. Um, But ultimately, I think that it's, it's, it's a tough position to believe so much in the passing game with the losses of those players. Yeah. I mean, you're returning receivers, your tight end, and he did not have a good year. In fact, there's no returning wide receiver that had a touchdown last year. Two returning reception touchdowns. There, there are two people who caught two touchdowns each, and they were Derrick Henry and Kenyon Drake. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you look at the outside, you've got who is penciled in right now to be the starting, you know, receivers, Chris Black, Robert Foster. Uh, all Americans in high school, you know, highly touted guys. So we'll see, you know, how that translates to major D one. Um, they're big time recruit Calvin Ridley, you know, a good receiver coming out of high school. So we'll see if these guys can translate to the next level. I, I, I'm tending to, you know, on the side of caution here, just because of sheer fact of they don't have a lot of experience and they're going to be playing some, you know, decent to really good sec defenses. So, it's it's definitely going to be tough, and I think a lot of the emphasis is going to be put on that defense. I mean, last year they allowed 18.4 points. That gives the offense a lot of ability to not have to produce to the levels as they did last year. Yeah, their defense has got to, you know, Kirby Smart, you know, he's a great defensive coordinator. So I don't know if the defense is going to be on par to what an Alabama defense used to be. I guess that's an unfair comparison when you compare years and you compare, especially college. Um, The secondary has got to get better. From Um, my perspective, (laughs) I see an improvement with the D-line and the linebackers, and I wouldn't be surprised to see Alabama stay in that top five um, in rushing defense, but... I think they're going to be back in the in the 70s in terms of passing defense. I don't think it looks good for yeah, I mean, for the, the the defensive backs this year. Yeah, and in a team like Alabama where they're going to be up in a lot of games, uh, so maybe that's also an unfair comparison that the defensive backs will need to get better when all teams do is pass against you. So maybe that's skewed a tad bit, but you've got to get better on the back end because you can you know rush the passer all you want, but if he's getting that ball out quick and if these receivers are running in routes and you know crosses and their defensive backs are lost, it doesn't matter how quick your defensive linemen are if they can't get to the quarterback you know before he gets the ball out of his hand. 
Right. I would just the 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 measuring stick I would use would be Michigan State. I believe yeah. they're very good against the the pass, and they're another team that doesn't give up a lot of points, and they scored a ridiculous amount of points. Like I didn't realize how strong they were offensively until I was looking at the stats researching this. But they're a perfect example of a team who, yes, teams were constantly throwing the ball against them to try to catch up, but they weren't having success. So I think there are times when you're right, when the situation dictates that you're going to give up more passing yards because that's all the other team is doing. But then there's a situation where maybe they know that that's what they have to do to score on you. If we had to pick uh, some players to watch – uh, from Alabama, who would you say? I mean, for me, it goes right to Derrick Henry. I mean, that might not be you know going out on a limb, but for me, he's the guy that if this team does well, I've said this before, if Alabama is going to do well and if they're going to compete, Derrick Henry will be in the discussion for every major award at the end of the season. Yeah, there's no question. It's going to, to me, it, it starts and ends with him. Moving along, uh, we'll go next to Arkansas. And we have an Arkansas team here in, in 2014 that was 102 in passing offense, 26th rushing offense for a, a, a final offensive average of 63rd, uh, 37th ranked pass D, 12th ranked rush D for an overall defense of 10th. Uh, they scored about 32 points a game, and they gave up the 10th fewest points in the country at 19.2. So this is another team moving right along the theme of Alabama, who just was not allowing their their opponents to score much, and they were putting points up on the board at the same time. Yeah, th- this is this is a team, you know, with Brett Bielema, you know, coming from the Big Ten of Wisconsin, that run-first offense. You know, uh, Alex Collins, Jonathan Williams, both 1,000-yard rushers from last season. Uh, oddly, they both rush for 12 touchdowns. I say odd because it's weird to have two running backs rush for double-digit touchdowns and the same number. I find that kind of funny. Um but um, interesting, interesting about the Arkansas, they could be – Brandon Allen could become the first ever three-year starting quarterback since Matt Jones in 2002-2004. And Matt Jones, we know, translated to the NFL to be a tight end, if you remember him. Uh, so he's working on his fourth offensive coordinator in five years. So that does not bode well for that offense. But I really like what Brandon Allen can do. Uh, you know, coming off a 2,200 yard performance last year, 20 touchdowns, only threw five picks. So, uh, you know, a guy that is pretty accurate, um, but it starts and ends with those two running backs. There's no doubt, and I'm I, I like Brandon Allen for his skill set. I like the fact that he can throw 20 touchdown passes because at the end of the day, that takes a lot of the focus off of that running game, and I don't think that he puts himself in the position to th- the uh, that scheme doesn't allow for him to be a fantasy relevant right. quarterback but there it is important to know that that just because you're a good fantasy quarterback doesn't mean that translates to being an actual good quarterback and I think he falls in in the second category where he is a good quarterback you know I, I think that the output for him could be about the same this year and to be honest with you I really think that that Jonathan Williams and Alex Collins are, are my projection is for each of them to hit about twelve hundred and twelve touchdowns each. I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility. No, absolutely not. But from a fantasy perspective, you know, daily fantasy perspective, that is an absolute horrible situation to be in if you're a fan and you're looking at an arkansas team going okay i've got two legit starting running backs which one do i take and then if the other one has a big run they leave jonathan williams in and you're sitting here with alex collins on the bench and the next game alex collins goes off so in actual you know real life you know football that's a great you know dilemma to have but for a fantasy perspective it's a nightmare no, they're absolutely both um, tournament only options unless one of them gets injured. Yeah, of it's, course. It's obvious that the other one's yeah. going to take the lead. Their receiving game is uh, is interesting. I, I I think that both Keon Hatcher and Hunter Henry have the potential to surpass last year's production. Maybe not much, and I think Hunter Henry, especially with AJ Derby gone, has the potential to be uh, a fantasy relevant tight end in, in specific situations. Absolutely, and a, and a name to uh, kind of watch out for, and maybe a guy down the road that really takes the next step forward. Redshirt freshman JoJo Robinson is a guy that has deep throw ability, and a guy like Brandon Allen who can throw the deep ball 
pretty accurately, um, especially in those play action fakes when you know you have your you know front seven just crash the line of scrimmage. A guy like Robinson can go deep, catch the ball, and obviously you, you touched on Ken uh, Keenan Hatcher. I apologize for that name. Um, he's going to lead that receiving core, so I'm really excited. Uh, I'm excited for this team because I feel like this could be a team that can really give some people some problems. Maybe maybe not upset you know a lot of people, but really give them a lot of a lot of a uh, lot of what's the word i want to use i don't even know uh i'm just going to give them headaches yeah. thank you. yeah thank you i don't know what i was trying to say there but the defense i think it's it's going to be in the same position it was last year i really don't see where the decline comes i actually think their the defensive backs have room to improve this year so i think it's also pretty clear to see that uh if we're watching anybody on this team other than the the player you just mentioned it would be collins and williams because they're the most fantasy relevant Absolutely. I mean, to, you know, just to play, you know, devil's advocate, you know, player to watch Brandon Allen, you know, a guy that can really do some things, you know, against the lower echelon SEC teams um, and at a conference. I really think he can make some noise on the tournament, you know, plays. Yeah, there's going to be specific situations yeah. where almost every player is going to end up having a good matchup. And, and oh. <laughs> what yeah. ends up happening, though, is you have to you have to let at that point real life what's happening in real life football dictate like don't force it just because if somebody is playing for a team and they don't run the ball much like texas a&m if texas a&m were to play an smu team that was notorious for getting destroyed by everybody uh there's no need to play the texas a&m running back against smu like because they don't run the ball that much you know Absolutely, it's kind of one of those things. Or, or Washington State would be a more appropriate because Russell Hansbro, uh, no, he he plays for uh, Missouri. I'm sorry, yeah. but yeah, there's just no need to do that. It happened so many times to so many different people last year where they would just try to take a, a team that was playing a team that was getting gashed for put- passing yards but they were a running team, and they would just try to force receivers. Well, that's not yeah. how this works. Coaches right. aren't going to abandon what has led them to success just because it's a good fantasy matchup. You know? no, absolutely. It's, it's asinine. So moving along, we'll go to our third A in the SEC West, and that's Auburn. And I think that's a team that both of us think could have a good potential this year. Um, in 2014, they, had, they ranked 67th in passing offense, 14th in rushing offense with an overall rate of 17th in the country. Passing defense was 70, rushing defense was 69 for an overall defense of 66th. They scored 35.5 points per game, and they allowed 26.7. So that's not really what you want to see. You don't want to see a team. I mean, 26.7 is not bad, but when we've just talked about two teams that kept the other team from scoring 20 points, and they're in the same conference, and they're in the same division, it, it, it kind of stands to, and they're both teams that score more than 30 points a game. It kind of stands to reason that it puts Auburn at a little bit of a disadvantage. Yeah, and I think the addition of Will Muschamp on that defense is going to pay huge dividends. Will Muschamp, uh, you know, former coach of Florida, their defense, he's a defensive guy, and Auburn's defense needs help. Well, I'm not going to sit here and tell you they were the worst defense in the world, but they need help, and Muschamp will immediately make that defense better. Um, basically it's his way or no way. And he's a defensive guy and he's very intelligent on the defensive side of the ball. So, so they uh, finished at 66th overall. Where would you, where would you project their defense to finish at the, at the end of the year? Are we talking top 50, uh, top 40? I would say in the thirties with this much, okay. with much, with much champ running specifically defense, you know, guys, guys have issues, you know, when they're coordinators, they have, you know, their own specific ways to do things. When you become a head coach, you have to go to media days. You have to go to the offensive side of the ball. You have to do all this other stuff with appearances and you can't focus just on in must champ situation, just on defense. So, you know, this is why I feel that, you know, when, when coordinators specifically go to head coaching, they don't tend to do very well, if they're not, if they're just focused on one side of the ball from the coordinator, I don't think he was ready to be head coach. Um, he's a great defensive coordinator. He, he could come coach my defense any day of the week. So I, I love the hire. I hate the hire, but I love the hire. <laughs> I would love to have him for you know a Miami team. But I think Auburn, they're going to be in the top 30 in a defense this year. 
<clears throat> that'll certainly help them because I, I really think that there's the potential for that offense to stay around the same production. I mean, look, Nick Marshall had some good years at Auburn. He's gone. Um, but Jeremy Johnson coming in, I, I think he actually is in a better position to exceed the passing numbers that Nick Marshall put together last year. I, I think that Marshall probably ends up having better production on the ground, but I, I think that 67th ranked passing offense will also see an improvement with Jeremy Johnson. And, and, and as a result of that, I think Duke Williams will really solidify uh, himself as the top wide receiver prospect for the NFL draft. What's your take on that? Yeah, Jeremy Johnson is a guy who I really feel could be a you know a sleeper guy for the Heisman at the end of the day. Um, he's got two to three, four really good receivers in Duke Williams, Ricardo Lewis, Marcus Davis, and, and the freshman Jason Smith. Uh, so you lose a guy like Sammy Coates, and that's a big loss. However, you you return a lot of experience and a lot of threats, and I think Auburn is a team where they have so much talent i almost don't know if gus malzahn knows how to utilize it all so i'm really interested to see with this team and with the addition of five-star running back rock thomas how they really utilize everybody in this offense because there's a ton of talent on this team it's going to be really interesting especially in the running back department because they lose their top three rushers including camera camera artist Payne. there's nobody that really jumps off the page oh and then you get a uh, JC transfer named Javon Robinson. I don't know if you saw his stats, but he yeah. put up 2,300 yards and 34 touchdowns last year. Now, granted, it's junior college, right? Yeah. But still, I mean, what what sometimes I have a tough time dealing with is understanding the transition because logically he's going to be playing against bigger, stronger, faster defensive players. But at the same time, he's also going to have bigger, stronger, faster players playing around him that should give him that opportunity. Now, I think we'll both agree those numbers will not be attainable no. next year for him. That's not no. going to happen. Absolutely not. But you know, as I said about you know Rock Thomas, who's the you know was one of the best recruits out of high school this past year. Obviously, like you said, you bring in the number one JC recruit in Javon Robinson. As I said, with the talent, there's so much unproven talent. Uh, this team is going to be fun to watch because this team could put up Gus Malzahn numbers of Gus Malzahn's past. You know what I mean? When uh, I just I'm excited for this team. There's a lot of potential here. Who's your one guy on this team? Rock Thomas, running back. Okay. I think this kid coming out of high school, uber talented. Uh, I mean, this kid has everything you want to see in a running back: speed, power, breakaway ability, uh, vision at the line of scrimmage. So I think this kid is going to be top I don't know, top 10 you know running back at the end of the season well I think if there's one thing we'll agree on is that it, it's pretty clear that it's going to be exciting if the if the SEC West was just the first three teams we talked yeah. about that would be enough well, right. I mean I, I think we've both walked away from all three of those teams saying in different ways they got a shot know, Alabama doesn't seem to be the team that it has been in years past on paper but it, it's Alabama so you're excited to see what they yeah. can do with a, a fresh inventory. Arkansas has the dual threat with the run. Auburn has, you know, these high-powered receivers and a better option, in my opinion, at quarterback in terms of passing in Jeremy Johnson. So there's that excitement there. Um, and then that brings us to our next team, which is LSU. And yeah. their numbers from last year were 116th in passing offense, 25th in rushing offense for an overall offense of 80th. Their passing defense was third in the country. Their rushing defense was 47th for an overall defense of ninth. Uh, they scored 27.6 points on average and gave up the fifth fewest points allowed in the country at 17.5. So again, we have three out of four teams that we've talked about so far that have been absolutely absolute juggernauts in terms of, of defense, but there's some bothering statistics yeah. In the LSU department, and I'm going to start at quarterback. You can't have you, you're not going to be a successful team with a passing offense that's 116th. No. And the no. problem here is too. Anthony Jennings was arrested in the off season. Yeah, he was. And so that leaves Brandon Harris, and their numbers were pretty similar last year, uh, but both of them were not good. 
is, is I guess, the bottom line. It's not the type of production that you need to be a, a program that goes the long haul. So I'm really curious to see what happens here because it's not for a lack of talent. I mean, you have Malachi Dupree and Travin Doral on the outside that could definitely catch the ball and make plays. So it's not like they don't have the talent to throw to. So this becomes a really interesting situation for LSU. Yeah, and, and a stat that jumped out to me is they, they ranked 13th in the SEC in scoring last season. Who LSU, was below them? Vanderbilt? Yeah, I do. I don't have that stat in front There's of me. There's no doubt in my mind it has to yeah, be it's Vanderbilt. Be Vanderbilt. Yeah, it has to be. So uh, that, that stat to me is just alarming. Uh, Brandon Harris from everything that I've read, watched, been told is that, you know, he, he needs to study the playbook and that's, that's troubling to say, you know, when you're at a big time school like LSU, you should be in that playbook 24 um, seven. If, if he is going to be the, the signal caller because of off the field issues for other people. So I love, I, I, I know you love this guy, but Leonard Fournette running back, it, it, it's it's not an issue to me running back to them is not an issue so when you all you have to do is have a quarterback that can get the ball to balan dupree travin durrell like you said these guys have the talent they the lsu might be the most talented team that may not win you know eight games ha, ha, that's unfathomable to me that's a really good – that's that's an excellent point because they play in a division where they're going to have tough games week after week after week. Um, <laughs> and if they're not getting play from the quarterback, look, you're ah. not going to shut down Leonard Fournette. I mean, they're – you know, I hear all the time people talk about, well, they'll just, you know, stack the box. And, and yeah, well, tell me how it worked to stack the box against uh, Amir Abdullah sometimes. And how did it work yeah. against Melvin Gordon? And they, it's just not that simple. If you have a highly talented running back, they're going to make their own route. And I think that is where Fournette is at. But what I will say is if you do have quarterback play, and you have talented receivers, that opens up all the more lanes for a guy like Fournette. And I'm, I mean, hey, look, you know I'm high on him. I, I, I think he's, he's in my top 10 for the Heisman conversation, but like we discussed in a previous episode, if this team as a whole isn't performing, then it's, it's lights out for him. It's, he's yeah. going to be eliminated the second time LSU loses a game. Yeah, absolutely, which is sad to say. And, but he is a guy that he's got first round ability. You know, can he stay out of the doghouse? You know, can he keep his head on straight? I, I don't know. That's questions to be answered later date. But ton of talent, too much. talent. What do you talent. think about their defense? Their defense loses one of the best defensive coordinators in the nation in Chavis. Um, gets replaced. So not replaced, but he left in it with Kevin Steele comes in to replace him. So this is a defense that needs to get better everywhere which again too much talent to be projected you know i have them going eight and four there's too much talent to be going eight and four you know i so badly wanted to put them at you know nine and three ten and two but you can't do it so this team i I just can't i don't understand how you have this much talent and you can't win i don't i don't get it at all yeah it's it it's it is mind boggling. I mean, and and I think we know that it comes. Look, they're not giving up even eighteen points a game. If they're losing, it's because their offense isn't yeah. getting the job done, and you know it's starting at the quarterback position. So until they have some stability there, and by stability, I don't mean a guy who starts all the games. I mean someone who does something with the time that they're given, who contributes, who who plays a vital role, who gets the ball to the receivers, who can then do something with it. So I mean, to me. Honestly, you know, I I think that it, look, there's nowhere to go but up in the passing department. Will it happen or not? I don't know. But honestly, I, I think that they'll be okay. The only player on this team right now, until the quarterback situation straightened out, that I'm paying any kind of attention to is Leonard Fournette, and I think you're on the same page. Yeah, I can't disagree with that. I'd love to say a guy like Dupree, but with the quarterback situation the way it is, you can't put him in anything other than he's good. But if nobody can get him the ball, how good is he? 
So. Right. Moving on, we'll go to Mississippi State, 2014, the 23rd ranked passing offense, the 23rd ranked rushing offense for a total of the 8th ranked overall offense. Passing defense, 117th, rushing defense, 44th, for an overall defensive rating of 80, 86th in the country. They scored 36.9 points per game, 36.9 points per game, and they allowed 21.7. The first thing that comes to mind, for being that poor of a defense, they sure didn't give up a lot of points. No, that was that old adage, Ben, don't break defense, and I think that defense was a, uh, you know, that was the definition of that. I mean, they, they gave up some yards and they gave up some things, but they never... There a lot of the defensive backfield made a lot of plays last season. You know, we'll see if they can continue to do that this year. But I, I think me and you can both agree that Dax Prescott, who set twelve single season records during his junior campaign, is going to be another star. And, you know, it does does he translate to the NFL? I think he does. So, what do you think about Dax coming into this year? Uh, he put up almost a thousand yards rushing, thirty five hundred yards passing, and forty one total TDs. Do you think he can do that again? Because I do. Uh, yeah, I see no reason he can't. Yeah, there's a high enough amount of talent on the offensive line to give him the protection he needs. Um, they're returning their top two receivers, and they have a, a, a good junior college transfer in Donald Gray. Uh, their wide receiver production is is sporadic. You're not. It's tough to tell when to take who when. You know, you don't know when when the, this specific player is going to have the good game. I would contend that that's a good thing, not necessarily for fantasy, but just in terms of enjoyability of the games. Yeah. You get to see a lot of different people have a lot of different moments. There's a bit of concern on my end because I think Josh Robinson worked very well with Prescott. And with him gone, who who's it going to be? Is it going to be Ashton Shumpert? that steps in yeah I, I mean he's the guy that's probably going to be handed to i mean right now uh i don't know of any other guy on that roster that can really i mean they've got some good redshirt freshmen they've got a you know an, an early enrollee in malik deer um he got some reps in the spring so that'll definitely help him moving forward to the fall but my bigger issue and, and this is a huge issue for me is their offensive line uh you lose three of your five and an interesting thing that I read about Mississippi State, they lost all three of their centers to graduation. So wow. you're literally looking at a guard to move over or a, or an incoming some anybody that can play center. You need them to play center. So their offensive line, to me, might make this team from a middle-of-the-road SEC team to a bottom half if that line does not have any continuity to it. I'm kind of the opposite with you in in some aspects. I think that even though they did have those losses, they bring a, a, a good amount of highly talented athletes in. And ultimately, a, a statistic that's always thrown around on the offensive line is, you know, game started. Uh, yep. And that is definitely a problem this year for them. But if you bring it, it, it just all depends on how well they get the game together and how well they mesh and how well they play with one another. But it's definitely an issue. My biggest issue for Mississippi State is I don't believe in that defense. They lost three defensive back starters that already ranked at 117 in the country. Yeah, yeah. I'm not buying. I think they're, they may end up being one of the SEC's worst defenses and potentially one of the worst passing defenses in all of college football. Yeah, they, they were the uh, last in the SEC in most passing yards allowed, and they also lost three starters from that secondary. That's just not so, good. But, that, but then the logic almost dictates if they were giving up that much and they lost three starters, could that be a blessing in, dis- in disguise? I mean, nah, they lost three nah, guys maybe. who gave up a bunch of yards. You know, you see what I'm saying here? If yeah. it hurts a team when they lose someone who gains a lot of yards, why wouldn't it help a team if they lost players – that yielded a lot of yards. So but doesn't that also tell you that the guys behind them weren't good enough to beat those guys out? There's no question. I mean, I think there's <laughs> problems all up and down that defense. I'm not saying the defense as a, as a whole is a bottom level college football defense, but I will say that it, it, it is not the strong suit for the SEC. Right. It's a profile that doesn't fit well. Not at all. Moving over to the other Mississippi, we'll talk about Ole Miss 
Passing offense was rated 38th last year. Rushing offense, 75th. Overall offense, 54th. Passing defense was 16th. Rushing defense was 29th for an overall defensive ranking of 13th. They scored 28.3 points, but the biggest statistic ultimately is they allowed 16 points per game, which is the least points allowed in the country. Yeah, they're they're. This is a team. You know, they finished nine and four. Uh, I think they could be better. I really do, but there are so many question marks on this team. Can Laquan Tread will come back healthy? Can Chad Kelly, who's coming in as a number one quarterback from the JUCO ranks, can he take that role and can he continue? You know what, Bo Wallace. You know, you have a good Bo Wallace and a bad Bo Wallace from last season. But you know, nine and four. He had some good moments. He had some really good moments. So if this Chad Kelly individual can come in and take the reins right off the go and have a good season, he's got weapons on the outside with Treadwell. He's got weapons. Yeah, I totally agree. I think uh, it's going to come down to things as simple as, you know, is he able to perform better in terms of touchdown to interception ratio than Wallace did last year? Uh, I could definitely see the yardage and the touchdowns being there for him because, like you illustrated, I mean, he still has um, Laquan Treadwell. He has a great, great tight end in Evan Engram. Um, the only guy that they're really, really losing is Vince Sanders. Uh, so I expect this team, in terms of, of the passing offense, to stay uh, relevant. I, I'm actually concerned a little bit about the rushing offense. I, I I think they're returning lots of starts on the offensive line. The top two rushers return. I think you can see a scenario where they could both see an increase in overall production. But I really don't honestly see a situation where one of them has a thousand yard year. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they return all five starters on the offensive line from last year, which is a huge deal. Um, they've got some good young offensive linemen that can rotate in if somebody gets hurt or whatever the case might be. But, you know, running back wise, with that starting five back and you look up front, you go, okay, those guys have been in the trenches. They know about the battles. So whoever the running back is, whatever combination they use, they've got to feel good running behind guys like that. Do you think the defense is able to maintain what it's been like? Yeah, man, they are so hit and miss to me. Uh, Kim Dietschy, uh, uh he's got to stay. He, he's got, his head is not on straight. I mean, he had issues playbook issues everything going on so if he can stay healthy and if he can be the all-american linebacker that he is this defense has the opportunity to be just as good if not better than last year who's the one guy you're looking at from this team Uh, for me honestly it's chad kelly you know the quarterback obviously quarterback ah cliche no but this is a guy that comes in with a lot of praise so he was obviously number one for a reason uh so let's see what he can do on the d1 level yeah, and I'm not going to disagree. I like Evan Ingram. I think that depending on what Chad Kelly's mindset is coming in, look, they don't have that like go-to back, like we said, that you know that in a pinch you can go to. Uh, if they did, you wouldn't have two guys with stats that were so similar. So I look for Evan Ingram to potentially be used more often in the red zone, which with his size and abilities would be a good thing. I think it's a good replacement for not having that power runner that a lot of other teams have in the Henrys and Fournettes. So that will bring us to the final team in the SEC West, but actually it's the team I've been looking forward to talking about most, and that's Texas A&M. Last year they, were, they had the 12th ranked passing offense, the 84th ranked rushing offense, the 32nd ranked overall offense, the 83rd ranked passing defense, 111th ranked rushing defense, the 104th ranked overall defense, But they did score 35.2 points a game while giving up 28.1. So this is a team that is, it's reminiscent to me of like a Bowling Green where they'll score points, but they're going to give points up. Washington State's another good example. Cal, there's actually probably quite a few um, West Coast teams that fit this description. The guy that I'm looking most forward to this year is, is Kyle Allen. I think he filled in admirably for the departed Kenny Hill last year. His TD interception ratio, 17-6, to isn't ideal, but what are you expecting from a freshman cast into a situation like that? In basically four games, aside from that, he put together 1,300 yards and 16 TDs. 
That's not bad production. Yeah, absolutely not. And this is a guy that comes in uh, very highly touted, um, has a pretty good arm. Um, I'm loving his receiver and Speedy Noel. I think that's a great name for receiver, by the way. <laughs> um, but this guy can fly. I mean, absolutely fly. Um, you know, other than that, they need a running back. They need a running back to step up. Anybody, Brandon Williams, Trey Carson, anybody, please, somebody step up because this team has potential to be really good. But will their running back issues cost them a lot of games? Because when you could put eleven guys basically in pass defense, you know, you Kyle Allen can't throw to anybody. You know what I mean? So I, the running back position to me is a huge question mark. Yeah, and I'm not going to disagree. I have them pegged to combine for about 1,200 yards with 8 to 10 scores, which I think is good contribution from a general football perspective considering yeah. the receivers. But at the end of the day, they need to have someone who's threatening enough that they have to leave a couple of guys near the line of scrimmage. Aside from Speedy Noyle, I, I really like Josh Reynolds. I think Ricky yeah. Seals-Jones and Edward Pope also stand to have solid seasons um, defensively. This is where it gets interesting because they're bringing in John Chavis from Yella LSU. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yeah, John Chavis, a guy yeah, Chavis, that, okay. that is a defensive coordinator god. Right. I mean, it literally, he knows the conference better than anybody, and he's coming into a Texas A&M team with Miles Garrett, who, you know, freshman record, 11 and a half sacks. So you come in, you bring him in with a guy like that, It's gonna their defense is going to be – <laughs> something to be reckoned with in my opinion well i mean there's a, nowhere to go but but up there that's true because they're they're ranked in the hundreds and rushing <laughs> yeah. and overall uh so without question they are they're gonna need some improvement i just think that the expectations need to be tempered a bit because i don't imagine it's going to be a, a a 104 overall defense to a 20 you know, I think it's no, going to take time. No. I think they could make a huge jump. If they get down to the 60s or 70s, to be quite honest with you, I think yep. you have to look at that as an improvement. If they end up giving up 24 points per game, you have to look at that as an improvement because you're making strides to becoming better. Absolutely. So and I think Chavis will, yep. If we're going to end the SEC West, this is the tough question right now is who is the one team do you think that, that stands the best chance to walk away with their hand raised this year? You know, everybody's going to say Alabama, and I'm actually not going to be one of those people. I think they're going to have a strong season. I think they're going to be Alabama, but I think Auburn beats them in the Iron Bowl. And I, I call it an upset, call it whatever you want to call it, but I think Auburn comes out of the SEC West this year. Yeah, I'm going to go the opposite direction, and I've, I've had them I've them ranked in my top 10 right now, and uh, you know it's going to sound crazy when I say it, but the more I look at this conference and this division, the more I really see an opportunity for a school like Texas A&M wow. to, to have a shot. I mean, look, they're bringing in a defensive coordinator that works wonders, and, and they're scoring enough points, and there's no reason to believe they won't continue to score that many points. They're bringing back most of what has brought them to, to the table here. So I think it makes them dangerous offensively. If they can shave four five points off of, of, of what they've allowed, it makes them a serious contender because these teams will beat up on each other. And they could just find themselves in the right place in the right time where where this is, and you know, they've, they've taken advantage of the opportunity. And it's out there, I'll give you that. But yeah. still, and, I think it's a I, possibility. I would say to that, um, at CFB Pros, please, fan base, to send all the hate to that direction. Do not send it to at CFB pros drew. I do not believe that. So all you Bama fans, all you Ole Miss fans, Auburn fans, LSU send the hate that way. That's all I'm saying. Send the hate that way. That's fine. I'm going to return each of those hate messages with a nipple pick <laughs> oh. and it will be mine oh. and it will not be pretty. Oh. So with that being said, I find that that's probably uh, the best place to cut off. Drew, where can we find you? Uh, again, follow me at CFB Pros Drew, and follow us on Facebook at College Football Pros. Follow us on Twitter, the main account where you send the hate mail to at CFB Pros. All right, with that, we will sign off. We will see you tomorrow when we talk about the SEC East. <laughs>